Good morning. Um, this is going to turn out to be the last uh, session of Biology of Fishes, the last offering of Biology of Fishes. This is it. Um, we'll, of course, have a final exam, um, and that's scheduled for December the 7th. Um, but we will conclude uh, the lecture transactions today that I plan to conclude. We've got a pretty thin house. Um, I'm sorry that more folks aren't here to hear the grand finale, the conclusion, but maybe they'll catch it later. Um, so, business. Um, everyone should now have submitted a Lab 5 report or be close to submitting one if you're going to submit it. Um, Lab 6, I hope you will do as I ask and play the uh, presentations that I did for Lab 6, um, the recycled ones from 2011. Come in, Chris. Um, beyond that, it's a matter just of, um, in the case of graduate students, um, getting your, your individual project going. I'm working with a number of you um, on that. So keep it up, uh, make some progress that time will pass quicker than you realize. You know, next week's Thanksgiving week, and then it's only uh, 10 days or so from then till the final exam on the 7th. Um, I have, as usual, um, requested the uh, PICA uh, assessment, which really has worked well for this course and others that I teach because it's equally accessible to people who are local and people uh, who are distant from campus. Unfortunately, it uh, won't be available to anybody that's not officially registered in a course, so that means the you folks who are my professional courtesy audit people uh, who would like to render an opinion will need to do it uh, in some other way, and I'd be happy to have you uh, uh, send it directly to me if you if you uh, want to, or to uh, Felix Arnold, our uh, staff guy in charge of graduate programs, since all of you are graduate level students, or send it to the department head. You know, uh, I'd like to have some kind of feedback from everybody, though. Um, the window opens for PICA on the 17th of November, right after, well, I guess, what, Friday this week. And uh, we'll stay open until. Uh, I think December the 4th. And if you haven't done PICA before, it's, uh, it's really easy. The questions that you respond to uh, are the same as the ones that you have been used to doing on a paper form. There's opportunity for comments to be added, uh, just text. Um, if you uh, change your mind about what you said and you want to revise your survey, you can do that up till the final minute of uh, whatever it is, I think it's probably midnight on December the 4th. And I, they don't, you know, at, at 11.59 you can do it, at 12.01 you can't. That's the way it works. And I've had a number of people who said, oh, I missed the, you know, I, I tried to do it, but they wouldn't let me in. No, they're not going to let you in. So you need to do it if you're going to do it. Do it early. Do it often if you like. Only one of the ones will count. It'll be the last one you submit. Uh, like to have your feedback. Um, so that's, that's that. Um, what I'd like to do today is to finish the last two segments that I had planned to cover in the course. The first of these has to do with a little bit of, uh, just a little bit of cynicology as it relates to fish. I want to talk about uh, sociobiology and home range. And I'll begin by making the point that Somebody, somebody surely has made to you by now that, you know, animals uh, tend to compete if they compete at all uh, for resources that are in short supply. You don't compete for things that are abundant, uh, only for things that are not abundant, things that are limiting. And for fishes, that's typically food and shelter. Um, fishes and, and animals in general don't <clears throat> directly compete for space. I mean, that doesn't happen. It's the properties of space that 
are competed for. After all, there's an infinite amount of space out there in the universe nearly as far as we're concerned. Uh, so it's not the space per se, it's the properties of that space that are important. Um, the fact that resources that fishes need and that you and I need are unevenly distributed uh, in time and space um, makes it possible for lots of different kinds of fishes and other critters to coexist in uh, continuing populations, if not stable in size. Uh, some, some would say it sort of throws competition into a, into a perpetual draw where nobody wins. If, if somebody wins, then somebody goes extinct. But the extinctions are not, um, not the rule, really. Uh, they certainly happen. <coughs> Competing fish, uh, like other animals, tend to be uh, similar, not dissimilar. Um, because uh, similar forms need similar resources. And so it's likely that resources are going to be limiting. The same resource is going to be limiting to two individuals uh, if they are, in fact, uh, similar in their needs. That's unless, of course, there are some specially evolved uh, uh, social uh, arrangements uh, that minimize competition. Because um, competing forms tend to be similar and not dissimilar, not, uh, dissimilar means that intraspecific competition tends to be more intense than uh, competition among species. Um, you know, I guess uh, a misconception is that competition is tooth and claw as somebody has called it, but most competition is, is a subtle kind of thing that you really need to uh, do careful analysis to detect, and then it's difficult to detect. Um, for our fishes, I have uh, put together this little uh, chart to uh, indicate what I see as the continuum from uh, forms that are very highly social and are strongly attracted to each other at the one extreme to forms that repulse each other. Individuals uh, repel each other at the other extreme. Uh, at the left-hand extreme, we have forms that uh, really can't survive or don't uh, aren't, aren't happy, as I put it, without being in the company of conspecifics. Strictly schooling fishes like herrings and anchovies fit in that group. Anybody that's ever tried to keep a threadfin shad in isolation knows about that. Tunas also fit in that group. Then you've got forms that school um, when it's to their advantage, but don't worry too much when they are in isolation. Uh, a lot of the minnows fit in that category, and salmonids, white bass, yellow bass, striped bass. Territorial forms um, like sunfishes and darters and a lot of the reef fishes um, defend territories, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and they are aggressive when anybody of the same species intrudes. Um, then you got forms that hardly ever tolerate another conspecific in the neighborhood and most of the large predators really fit in that group. Fish like muscalunge. And big marlins, I guess, would also work there. So I guess that's that's pretty clear. Um, fish can move from one place on that continuum to another depending on their age class or reproductive state, time of year, season. Um, Little ones tend to be in different places compared to big ones. And breeding individuals tend to uh, react differently to other conspecifics, um, obviously uh, as a function of the sex of the other individual. Dominance hierarchies uh, occur in fishes, um, just as they do in, uh, in birds, which is, I guess, where they're more familiar to most folks. 
uh, peck orders they're called because of birds and chickens. And uh, the idea is that uh, if you put a bunch of fish together, conspecifics, they'll sort of sort themselves out and decide who's boss and who's not. And uh, after a while, you can observe and see, uh, actually uh, determine by observation what the peck order is, who, who dominates whom. And uh, peck orders can be linear, but sometimes they can be nonlinear, like this one, where A dominates B, but B and B dominates both C and D, but C and D don't really interact. You know, they're sort of ignoring each other, and both C and D dominate E. E has got a tough place in either peck order. With fishes, uh, you know, if any, if you have had experience watching your fish, you can learn quickly, you know, the the peck order, and you can see the effects on uh, the general welfare of individual fish. One of the commonest uh, evidences of dominance in Things like centrarchids is a nice bright color, uh, sort of a light color usually. And then if the fish is real dark, that's not a good sign. He's probably going to be an e-fish, being intimidated, being picked on, hiding out, being inconspicuous. And it's kind of hard to hide out in the aquarium. Um, territories are spatial regions that are defended uh, from intruders, uh, particularly from conspecifics. Uh, nesting territories uh, tend to be occupied by reproductively uh, mature adults. And in a lot of species, the centrarchids, for example, it's the males that do the holding of territories. Um, feeding territories are more general and occur at all sizes. There tends to be an increase in the size of the territory with the in, with an increase in the size of the individual fish. Um, there tends to be an increase in the size of the territory as habitat decreases. Um, and there tends to be uh, uh, an increase in the size of the territory as the density of fish uh, decreases. And I guess the logic here is that, you know, if you're... A big fish, you need more resources, so you need to hold a larger territory, and you can defend it because you're bigger, typically. Uh, if habitat quality is poor, then it takes a bigger territory to support the same biomass. And so there tends to be an increase in the size of the territory as habitat deteriorates. And the logic is the same. If there's a, a high density of fish, then um, the size of the territory has to uh, has to uh, decrease per individual or the territoriality has to break down. Uh, the average diameters of fish territories uh, in freshwater, particularly in uh, coral reefs, I guess that's where it's been most studied in clear trout habitats, tends to be about 10 to 100 fish lengths depending on conditions. So I've kind of drawn a little cartoon down here to sort of indicate some territories. Notice these territories don't overlap. You know, they have boundaries that come up to each other maybe, and those boundaries then are the defense points. And you can see, you know, you can see territories uh, in your uh, aquarium if they're, if they're there, and you can see them in clear waters uh, if, you, if you're used to looking at a a stream and watching trout, you can easily spot where the territories, where the boundaries are of territories. Um, in my mockingbird population in my neighborhood, I've been able to observe where the territories <coughs> start and stop, and it's really interesting. One of them is right on the right in the middle of the street in front of my house, and these two male mockingbirds at certain times will meet there. And they do this little dance. They will hop along a line facing each other for about 10 feet, just watching each other, and then they'll hop the other direction. And neither one will cross the line. Uh, social hierarchies and territoriality tend to go together. Forms that are, uh, forms that are territorial tend to be uh, aggressive. Under crowded conditions, fish that would normally have individual territories 
are unable to have their own individual territories. And so the the territory collapses, and instead you've got a, just a dominance hierarchy, which is the situation that you often see in an aquaria. You know, the whole the whole aquarium is the boss fish's territory, and everybody else just sort of hides out and gets dominated. Um, my my view is that as fish density increases along the x-axis here, from nobody at all or just one fish over here on the left, um, you know, aggression increases in fishes of this type. Um, and at low at low densities, the fish don't encounter each other, so it's really irrelevant. It's not defined. But then, as density increases, most of the fish can hold a territory because there's plenty to go around. As density increases even more, only the dominant fish will hold a territory, and that would be the case in maybe an aquarium situation. And then finally, nobody holds a territory. Uh, it's just dominance hierarchies, and then maybe you get a social collapse where you don't see the same kind of aggression anymore. And fortunately, that's the way it works in aquaculture. You know, usually we're over here at <clears throat> levels of density that are so high that nobody can keep up with, with who's boss. And so fish just sort of ignore each other. Even species that would normally have uh, strong uh, aggressive tendencies will tolerate each other if they're very crowded, as they often are in, in, in uh, intensive aquaculture. So aggression goes to zero there. Obviously, the adaptive value of these kinds of social arrangements, uh, dominance and territoriality, is that they uh, optimize the partitioning of habitat among individuals and give the individuals that are best competitors and have the strongest uh, potential uh, control of the system. And a lot of times that happens pretty much without physical damage. In other words, the fish intimidate each other, but they don't actually attack each other. Sometimes they do. There's a lot of fin nipping going on, but rarely is that a fight to the death in fishes. Uh, it may have occurred to you, thinking and looking at that last slide, that you know uh, dominance hierarchies um, and and territoriality uh, provide a flexible way for habitat to be partitioned into units, and uh, it's a natural kind of unit in that each unit has a carrying capacity of one individual. Um, and what this does is lead to a relatively stable population size a size that fluxes up and down depending on the general conditions of the system. Good times, more habitats, smaller, more habitats, smaller, uh, better habitats, smaller territories, and in bad times the territories have to increase, population density goes down. Also, territoriality uh, provides a flexible mechanism for dispersal, and uh, there hasn't been enough work done in this area as far as I'm concerned, but I think the work that has been done shows that uh, in fishes, just as in uh, Paul Arrington's muskrats, it's the juvenile individuals that get excluded, uh, get pushed out, uh, are forced to find new homes. Uh, ju really small juveniles are tolerated by the adults, and adults tolerate each other, but it's the, it's the intermediate-sized fish that tend to get displaced just like it's the juvenile muskrats that tend to get displaced and have to find new homes in the classic study done by Arrington. Uh, home range, a related idea, but not to be confused with territory. Um, home ranges uh, can overlap each other and often do, but uh, the territory is um, a smaller unit of habitat within the home range of the individual that is defended from other individuals. So um, home range is just defined as the place where the animal spends most of its time, but a place that's not necessarily defended in all of its parts from other individuals. And there's some neat approaches and clever 
technical procedures for estimating the home ranges of individuals uh, using tracking techniques, that sort of thing. Uh, minimum convex polygons and labels like that get applied. Um, home ranges overlap. Uh, they contain the territory, if there is a territory. And the size scale is typically 1 to 100 territories in size. I'd say more on the upper end of that range than the lower. So what you got is 10 to 100 fish links is the territory, and then the home range is 1 to 100 times that uh, area. And notice I'm talking pretty much in two dimensions here. Because I'm looking down on the system and I'm thinking about it the way that humans do, you know, mapping in two dimensions. But a lot of fish habitats have a third dimension that are that's very important. Um, the boundaries of uh, home range are similar, I think, to the boundaries of territory. A lot of times they're set by some sort of natural habitat break. Um, the uh, riffle. For example, at the bottom of a pool becomes a barrier, becomes a, a place where the home range ends in stream fishes. Um, obviously, the boundaries of the reef, you know, would be the end of the home range for a reef fish because it wouldn't want to wander off into non-appropriate habitat. Chemo perception and vision are both involved in uh, recognizing the boundaries of habitat. Uh, and the habitat uh, home range can uh, persist for most of the fish's lifetime. Um, lots of displacement experiments to see what happens, you know. Do they return to the home range? And do they recognize the same boundaries from one season to the next? You know, sometimes as you go from a, a juvenile uh, year class one fish to a two year old fish uh, you know the needs increase so maybe the territories and maybe the home range as well increases but the core tends to stay relatively constant um, the adaptive value I guess is pretty obvious and it is that you know you gotta you're gonna have a better chance of surviving if you know uh, the country you're in, if the terrain is familiar, if the habitat's familiar, so it better better to be uh, well acquainted with your system than to be a stranger in it. Social facilitation, um, this occurs when one individual fish is benefited by and benefits another individual by being part of the same group. And certainly uh, you know, schooling fishes obviously um, have a tremendous amount. It's almost obligatory social facilitation in the case of schooling, truly schooling fishes. But even fishes that don't school in a uh, don't school in a in a classical rigorous sense uh, still are uh, able to benefit from other individuals of the same species. And there's a lot of what I call monkey see, monkey do type learning that goes on in fishes. Anybody who's ever kept an aquarium uh, can observe the new fish that's added to the system sort of learning the ropes from older fish, figuring out what's food and what isn't, for example, uh, from the old timers that are in the system. Um, we saw a lot of that even in, in uh, uh, experiments that we did with tunas. Um, Maze learning even has been demonstrated in fishes and in other animals too that uh, fish that are familiar with the maze are observed by the newcomers and the newcomers learn more quickly to find a goal uh, observing the fish that have been there a while. Uh, back when we did experiments with live fish and biology of fishes, one of the things we tried to do in uh, in the respirometry lab was to investigate uh, social facilitation because we had had uh, read papers that suggested that fish reduce their level of anxiety when they are in company of other 
Yukon specifics. And uh, we never got very good results. The way we tried to do it was by uh, was seeing whether or not just fish that could see themselves in a mirror would uh, reduce their metabolic rates. And sometimes it looked like that was what was happening, but the effect wasn't very large, I don't think. Um, other research has shown that that there is a reduction in metabolism probably associated with uh, anxiety reduction. Maybe the windbird goes down when fish are in the company of other individuals. And then there's been a lot of work on uh, what some people call conditioning of the water. And there are aquarists who would swear to you that there's something magical that happens when you hold fish in a, in a, a in water for a while to that water, that it's uh, much more suitable to a new fish once the fish have been there before. Sometimes it just amounts to um, the proper development of biofilters that are associated with the aquarium, I think, and uh, processing of waste like ammonia. But I think there may be more to it than that. Um, for example, it looks like fish slime is a pretty good chelator of heavy metals, and so more individuals in a in a water bath actually will take uh, some of the some of the contaminants out by chelation. Um, schooling. We haven't had a lot to say about schooling, but I've talked about it in the context of perception. I would define a school of fish as an aggregation that results from mutual attraction among individuals and not just a group of fish that happen to be in the same place at the same time because they all have similar requirements that are met in that place and not in other places. Those are groups, but I wouldn't call them true schools. In other words, the mutual attraction component has to be a major idea. Um, Station holding in a current, you know, looks a lot like schooling, and sometimes you can see fish that will position themselves and orient to a fixed object, and then they are lined up, naturally enough, because they're all dealing with the same environment, but that wouldn't be considered a social school. Um, true schools are characterized by orientation of fish in the same direction, and movement in unison to the degree that is almost uh, magical. If you've watched a school of something like Menhaden um, uh, move uh, and you see that you know they're turning so so much uh, in unison that there's it's just one flash from their from their sides. You know it's like a mirror that flashes everywhere at once. Um, fish schools uh, mark marker studies show are not uh, typically uh, led by a single individual. It's just whoever happens to be in front. It's almost like they do if you're a military person then it's kind of like flanking movements instead of column right, column left where whoever's on the right flank becomes the new leader if the school turns to the right. Um, schools tend to be uh, similar sized and um, the individuals in the school tend to be similar in size, and, and most folks believe that's because, obviously, similar-sized fish need similar resources, and the school is together in the same place at the same time. But it's also, I think, a function of uh, the fact you swim as a function of your speed. Uh, your, uh, you swim at a speed that's a function of your size, and so uh, it's hard to keep up if you're a little guy, and uh, if you're a big fish, maybe you... You know, you're having to uh, pace yourself a little too much. So what happens experimentally is that uh, as fish uh, tend to undergo um, size dispersal through growth in the school, uh, they'll sort of do some self-grading and sort themselves out. And when they meet with another school that's slightly different in size, then the individuals will sort of be traded. And that way, I think... Schools, even though they tend to persist, there's um, exchange of individuals when schools meet. Uh, most of the truly schooling fishes are pelagic, open water fish. 
Uh, all the ones that you know you can almost think about, like I've got listed there, are fish of open water. Um, another characteristic of true schoolers uh, like tunas and, and uh, herrings is that they tend to be uh, broadcast spawners and uh, the eggs tend to be pelagic and float. So, and lots of them, you know, highly prolific, a lot of fecundity. Um, other fish tend to just school at one stage in their lives, but not at others. And uh, a lot of the cichlids school all the time, except during the breeding season when they're territorial. And then uh, other fish uh, may uh, school when they're in the breeding season. Um, red drum tend to form good schools, mainly at the, at the time of spawning. And they're less less really inclined to school when they're when they're young fish in the bays um, a lot of the salmon tend to school when they're uh, growing up on the high seas but once they um, home to fresh water to spawn then they're acting as individuals uh, centrarchids and catfishes school as juveniles but not as adults and it's hard to uh, be around a freshwater system at the right time of year and not notice um, schools of little catfish, little bullheads, for example. They just look like little black balls in the water almost sometimes. How many fish in the school? Well, uh, my, my notes say, although I'm a little less convinced of that than I was when I wrote them, that there tends to be an inverse relationship between uh, the number of si fish in the school and the size of the individuals. So really big fish like Giant bluefin, you know, uh, maybe not so many. But when you're talking little menhaden or herring, it's hundreds of thousands maybe in, in one school. The shape of the school tends to be irregular, but if you had to describe it in some way, you'd probably say it's sort of like an ellipsoid when it's moving. And then when it isn't moving so much, uh, it tends to be more spherical and sometimes gets more compact if something's if something is threatening the school, and I think I already talked about that idea of clustering together to uh, presumably m give the impression of a, of a big animal instead of a bunch of little animals. Cohesion of the school and persistence, um, you know, it tends to be a visual thing for most truly schooling fishes, and so they tend to school and move around uh, uh, most uh, in, a, in a most stereotype manner during the daytime, but at night uh, the school tends to break up and have to reform again the next morning. And like I say, or already said, tagging shows that schools persist over long periods of time, but there is some self-grading apparently going on by size. Why school? Well, uh, here are some reasons that are usually presented by people that work in this area. If you're a schooling form in a vast open ocean, uh, it might help to have uh, individuals of the opposite sex handy. So mate availability is presumably facilitated in schooling. Um, predator protection, the whole idea of more eyes to see and more ears to hear, not so much ears maybe, maybe ears. Um, uh, the appearance of a school as a uh, as not as a bunch of individuals that are good prey, but maybe a single superorganism. And there are some more subtle arguments, like the uh, what I call the Brock Riffenberg hypothesis uh, or the satiation and counter frequency hypothesis. And the idea there is that um, if you uh, aggregate your biomass in a high density, uh, but in a small amount of volume and, and separate yourself from similar aggregations of biomass that are other places, uh, that if a predator does come upon you, it can only eat so much. And once it's satiated, then it loses interest and wanders away and has to go find another school. And they're hard to find. So simulation shows that this is a good strategy, and the Germans knew that 
uh, during World War II uh, with their wolf pack strategy and the U-boats, you know, and the convoys. The Allies uh, convoyed their shipping across the Atlantic, and the whole idea was, hey, get everybody together, and if the U-boats come after you, they're only going to get a few, and they've lost, they've exhausted their torpedoes. But then the counter strategy is to do the wolf pack thing and, uh, you know, hunt in groups. So if you find a convoy, you can really go after it if you've got lots of torpedoes. Um, sort of in, uh, in, in nature, you know, wolves uh, sort of do the same thing with caribou in that uh, they hang out, you know, they just follow the caribou. So that way they will be, their, their torpedoes will be replenished, that is their hunger, their need to take more, or capacity to eat more caribou is, will be recovered after a while. So even though you don't need any caribou right now, maybe it's smart to keep with the herd so that when you do, it'll be handy. So those are strategies that have been suggested and counter strategies. And there have been some reports of, uh, you know, uh, sharks following tuna schools, for example. And maybe it's the same kind of thing. Social facilitation uh, is another idea, the fact that, you know, you got somebody to learn things from. Uh, improvement of forage search efficiency, and I talked to you about uh, the tuna school and the signaling that goes on uh, through feeding bars. Um, when one part of the school encounters forage, uh, the fact that it's done so is transmitted to remote, remote parts of the school by the successive progressive uh, display of feeding bars. And then there's some things that have to do with hydrodynamic benefits, and that's, you know, the same idea there as, um, as uh, flocks of geese, for example, where the way you fly in the V formation, you know, maybe you uh, reduce the drag for the individuals behind by having an individual ahead. And if you change places periodically, then everybody benefits, maybe. So you're essentially drafting. That's the strategy on the highway these days. Not a very, sometimes a dangerous strategy. Follow it too close. So, I uh, already talked about, uh, let's see, now we, I guess we're going to interspecific inter cooperative arrangements and getting away from schooling here. Cleaning symbioses, I already uh, uh, belabored a little bit, I guess, the last time we met and uh, talked about the coral reef situations that involve uh, things like wrasses and some damselfish, um, butterfly fishes that act as cleaners, and even some shrimp. Um, those are obviously very highly evolved and very complex. Uh, it's almost... Uh, uh, it's difficult to imagine how these things got, got formed in the first place. I even mentioned the mammalian uh, uh, cleaning symbioses of those warthogs and uh, the uh, little uh, uh, African mongoose, the uh, meerkats, I guess is what, it, what they are. Other kinds of mutualisms, um, anemone fishes and sea anemones. You know, brightly colored little anemone fishes. They're nice little aquarium fish, and they hang out in the tentacles of sea anemones and and uh, and dare anything to try to bite them. And if they do, then the sea anemone gets fed, I guess. Uh, there's a fish uh, that hangs out with Portuguese men of war the same way. Um, and these little fish have um, a uh, mucus that... that uh, Inhibits the discharge of the nematocysts or the nematocytes from the from the man of war, which is kind of a neat. And again, hard to see how that kind of thing gets started. A lot of really bad trial and error, I would think, had to happen somewhere along the way there. Other associations, uh, food scavenging, maybe some cleaning going on, uh, sentry duty by remoras. Uh, and related fishes, you know, if I ask you again this time, don't tell me remoras are parasites. They're not. 
uh, even though they got this modified sucker on the back of their heads, they're not sucking nutrients, they're just hanging on. And then when food comes, they turn loose and become a good uh, uh, grazers, I guess we would say. Um, they, they, they are associated with a lot of different large-bodied forms um, from sharks to whales, uh, ocean sunfish, marlins, pilotfish uh, also have this sort of an association in that they uh, swim with uh, a lot of sharks and, and uh, sort of ride the bow wave and presumably benefit by this uh, savings of, of swimming energy that way. And they, they share in the food. Okay, that's the what I want to say about sociology. Not a lot. You need to learn it from somebody that does synecology, I guess. I would like to uh, end uh, today and the semester, the course, by uh, actually having a conclusion instead of just a dead end the way it typically is in your courses. The way it always was in mine, you know, the instructor just ran out of time and said, well, that's it. <laughs> right in the middle of a sentence sometimes. Well, I don't want to do that. I want to... I want to actually uh, sort of pull things together a little bit and maybe present some extensions of ideas, um, stimulate you to think uh, down the road about important stuff. So I call this a conclusion, uh, toward a synthesis actually. And I'll try to just go through a logical progression of ideas here and, and hope that it works for us um, First thing I'd like to do is acknowledge uh, uh, F.E.J. Fry, um, who um, was the one who stimulated me to really think about these ideas mostly. And what he said was, in his little book, uh, which is available uh, as a PDF there on the in the course archive, that uh, animals are are organized sections of the environment. And if you think about it, that's what they are. They're concentrated uh, environment. And the organizational plan that is a fish or an animal has been dictated by evolution. Uh, and, but that evolution has been in the context and, and, and faithful to uh, what we know as the laws of physics. Uh, maybe some laws that we don't know yet. Um, you know, there's, some, there's three or four that are well known and everybody accepts them. Um, you know, up to about the third law, you know, the zero, the first, and second, third. I think the third one is the one where it says everything goes to absolute zero temperature-wise. Everything, you know, is maximally dispersed. And the second, the second law is the one that says that uh, uh, things tend to run down, you know, go to disorder uh, towards, towards uh, maximum entropy. And then... Uh, the first law is the one that says that, you know, that's the conservation of energy law, I think. And uh, so the, the, you know, some of these other laws may relate to the things that Fry was talking about. Uh, the fourth law, you know, and I think there have been people like um, uh, the Odom brothers, uh, Gene Odom particularly, who, who argued that, you know, animals uh, are self-organizing systems and redirect the flux of energy, and I think he learned some of that from from Fry and people before him, Latka. Um, so what I'm what I'm saying here in the way of summary, and, and all you need to be worried about, I guess, or not worried, but interested in, is the fact that you know everything's got to be consistent with the way physics works, and fish, um, like like you and me, exchange materials with the rest of the environment in a way that redirects resources to power the fish. And the, the power is used to, you know, for locomotion and growth and reproduction and fighting disease and all the other good things that, that animals have to do. And uh, Fry argued that environment has its effects on fish activities only through metabolism. And what that really says is that the effects of environment 
our own individual animals and not on groups of animals directly, but only through their individuals. So it's metabolism, the individual, and then the individuals on the group. So I think that makes good sense. He, he categorized environment, all of environment, into five classes, and I think we've talked now about all of those as we've gone along, but I don't know that I've pulled them all together in one list before. Uh, I guess I did in Lab 6 when I went through that presentation. You've heard that yet. But controlling factors of environment are things like temperature and pH and pressure that uh, affect the pace of molecular reactions. The Arrhenius effect of temperature would be a really good example of the controlling effect of environment on metabolism. Uh, limiting factors are resources that when they're in short supply tend to restrict the maximum capacity of the system to perform useful work. And so DO would be a resource that would be really important for fish. Uh, nutrients, uh, energy substrates from nutrients would also be that kind of factor. Masking factors, I just talked about uh, the other day, I guess, somewhere. I don't remember where it was now. We're talking about uh, the load that is imposed yeah, by uh, parasites, for example. Um, extreme salinity would be a physical chemical factor that loads the metabolism of fish, forcing it to do extra work just to maintain itself. Lethal factors completely interdict metabolism. They destroy the machine that is metabolism. So some toxic materials operate as lethal factors. Uh, and predators, I think, also represent a good biotic lethal factor. Um, directive factors are the least uh, understood and I think the most uh, interesting to me of all of Fry's factor classes. And there's really two subsets. One of them is acclimation, acclimatization, the kind of adaptation that goes on physiologically within the individual to better equip it or better enable it to handle, handle environmental change through time. And then there's, uh, there's uh, distributional responses like uh, clinokinetic avoidance that allows the animal to optimize itself relative to gradients or discontinuities of environment through space as well as time. So I like that, that directive set. Um, at the level of the individual fish, all of these uh, uh, all of these factors affect metabolism and the output from the metabolic system, the emergent properties of the individual that really get to be, I think, at the forefront of what's important are three things really, survival, growth, and, re and distribution. And, you know, I'm talking now juveniles, I'm trying to, uh, you know, I think uh, reproduction is at that interface between aut ecology and sin ecology, and I'm a little less sure of myself in dealing with, with reproduction. You could add that to the group. Certainly the production of, of uh, reproductive materials, gametes, you know. But that, some of you might consider that a subset of growth, too. So really, that's all there is. You know, there's surviving, and if you survive, do you grow and get bigger? And that's the, the mandate, according to that fourth law, some people would say, is the mandate to increase in biomass, to, you know, claim more than your fair share of resources and concentrate them in a, in a scarce you know, universe, concentrate resources, organize. Um, and then distribute yourself through the habitat so you can do all that better. You know, go to places that are good, avoid places that are bad, particularly avoiding places you're going to die if you can. You know, I mean, that's, uh, that's, the way these, that's the way the activities emerge, I think, at the level of the individual. And take the individual then to the next level of organization, the group, the cohort. Because you've got a lot of surviving individuals, each one's growing, and all of that production is being distributed. 
So really you could say that survival, growth, and distribution lead to production as maybe at the next level. Production of new fish. Um, so the result of these is the individual's contribution to production of its cohort. I'm trying to paint this a little bit more brightly in brighter colors than 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 what the words would suggest but I I think you know the words say it I mean on paper on 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 the word document so ecofish is an attempt on my part to pull all this together as best I can infer what those rules are and interpret them um, you know uh, and and pass them on to you um, embodies the rules of the way in which time and space varying environment is translated biologically into the raw materials of fish production. Don't, don't ever uh, accuse me of telling you that ecofish is the be-all and the end-all. It's certainly not. It's not the, you know, it's not the whole truth, but I think it, it um, provides a, a, a way of thinking about how to find out what the truth is and how to explore the possibilities how to get closer to the truth. I call it a systematic tool for probing the truth. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not going to, I suspect, uh, make a lot of progress in my career now in achieving this last step. I hope somebody else will. Um, what I say here is Ecofish's predecessor, Ecofiz.fish, that's the published uh, core of ecofish represents uh, what I would call the first working component of what some of my colleagues and I see as an emerging pattern in the organization of ecological systems, one that's faithful, I think, to the laws of thermodynamics and, and extends that fourth law a bit. And I want to work through this pattern with you and see if, you, see if you'll buy it. You're all expert now on the fundamentals and the basis, so it's either there or it isn't for you. The first uh, of the patterns is, and this is a drawing that looks similar to something I've already shown you. I think this was actually published in, in a, one of our papers, and I just took it out, and it's, really, it's got that strange blue background there. But this is, the, this is the graph that shows you a process rate, in this case oxygen uptake, as a function of the resource that supports that process, in this case oxygen, and, and the O2 WI here had to do with oxygen uh, in the oxygen in the water coming in. I think was what I was in current oxygen concentration. And so you've got uh, you just think of it as DO. That's the way I've shown it to you. Is is metabolism routine metabolic rate or, or metabolic rate versus DO? And then we've recognized several levels of metabolism, and the one that's missing here is standard. You know where it is, though. It's halfway between that routine and the zero. And then there's maximum metabolism, which we've called active metabolic rate. And in between is metabolic scope. And here, uh, this is really metabolic scope for growth. It's not metabolic scope. That's, metabolic. that's the difference between active and standard. This is just between active and routine. And uh, the slope of this line, you will have heard me talk about if you've heard Lab 6's presentation. The argument is, and there's a, actually there's a, in the ecofish, uh, ecofish.fish homepage, there's a derivation of the, of maximum metabolic scope. Uh, Derivation, and I think that's where maybe this uh, some of this this terminology came in, like O2WI. So the whole idea is that that maximum met that metabolic uh, marginal metabolic scope is the rate at which uh, metabolic scope is increasing at the margins uh, over here, and it can be estimated as simply the ratio between the routine metabolic rate and the limiting oxygen concentration for that rate. That's the slope of the line. If the line's going through zero, zero. And so the argument is that fish can 
maintain a routine level of performance metabolically uh, as resources become diminished, the availability of resources falls, but you can only do that up to a point. You know, some, sooner or later you run out of compensatory mechanisms and the system is going to fail, so the only uh, response is to shut down the system a little bit. And you can do that if it's a routine metabolism. You can do it for a while, you know, until ecological failure becomes biological failure. But if it's standard, you can't do it very long at all, you know, just a matter of minutes or hours maybe, and, and you're going to die from insufficient, uh, metabolic in, insufficient metabolic processing. So it's good to be over here where metabolic scope is high. You know, it's good to maintain large resources or at least uh, stay out of this troublesome country over here to the left. And that's a that's an argument that persists through the through this whole pitch that I'm going to make to you. Okay, so in the in, in uh, one of the papers that I that I alluded to, uh, we've argued that you can you can translate this kind of um, argument to the next level, the level of the population of animals. Take it from alt ecology to sin ecology. And thinking about it in the context of that paper with Weinmiller and Miller and uh, uh, Hank Van de Veer in the Netherlands, uh, we argued that the resource that's really important at the level of the population is the density of spawning individuals, the, the number of spawners available to produce the next generation. And performance that's really important is recruitment, the recruitment rate. And there is this analog of routine or standard metabolism you'd call maintenance recruitment. And the argument is that, uh, you know, no matter how many spawners you got, you better be able to maintain just the right level of recruitment to maintain the population into the next generation. And it's easy to do that when spawners are abundant, but as for whatever reason, the density of spawners is reduced, you finally reach this critical density where um, you just can't maintain the population anymore. So the population runs the risk of going extinct if you do that more than a couple of cycles. Um, on the other hand, there's this maximum level of recruitment, which starts off being the analog of MMS is, is very simple. It's the potential maximum recruits per year. It's the number of spawners, maybe female spawners if you calculate it that way, multiplied times the fecundity of each female. That's the maximum possible rate at which you can recruit. You're, gonna, you're not going to recruit at that rate normally because you're not going to have survival of all those progeny. But that would be the maximum. Is that, so, is that the potential maximum? This or is the, the line this, this line here is the potential maximum rate. And here's the true maximum. So why does the actual maximum bend away from or, or asymptote? Uh, and and what, it's, what it's doing is it's responding to the capacity of the system to support all those recruits. We call that carrying capacity. A lot of arguments about carrying capacity. I don't care. I'm going to use the word anyhow. I call it carrying capacity of the system. Good system has higher carrying capacity. Bad system has lower capacity. If the capacity is reduced, then the maximum rate of recruitment bends sooner. So the analog of metabolic scope for growth of the individual is the scope for stock increase. It's the rate at which the stock can increase. And there's a lot of concern in population uh, biology about the kind of pattern that you get when you start plotting uh, recruitment against stock. And one of the concerns is there's a lot of noise. You know, it points all over the place. But, uh, you know, typically the patterns look like, you know, a convergence of all that stuff to a point over here. And sometimes people say, is there a stock recruit relationship? Well, our argument in that paper was there better not be. If there's an evident stock recruit relationship, then you are getting close to this critical point over here. That's why you're seeing this slope. If you're over here, you know, it looks like a shotgun blast. No stock recruit. That's good. That means there's plenty of recruitment to support a lot of stock. Resources must be good. So, 
the same pattern, but a different level of organization. Let's try to move one more up, and it gets even more tenuous and more interesting, I think. Now we're at the level of community ecology. We've left population level, and we're jumping up a level to communities now. And uh, the argument we made was that the proper resource to look at is the density of species, the number of species per unit area of habitat. Uh, that's the resource. And the rate at which that resource is processed is species diversity, otherwise known as system richness, otherwise known as 1 over D. What's D? D, D is uh, Simpson's diversity index, not to be confused with Simpson Bowles diversity index. Those of you who are following modern politics would catch that reference maybe. Um, so okay, the same kind of argument. You got an essential level of richness that you got to have in order to perform all the functions that the community has to perform. You know, there has to be bakers, sailors, ta tailors, candlestick makers, you know, in this community. And uh, uh, so that's the essential richness that, that has to be there. Uh, as the number of species declines, you it gets more and more problematic that you can meet all the needs of, fill all the niches with the appropriate players. You know, and if you get to a point where some essential system function isn't being met, just like some essential life activity isn't being met by the available metabolism, then the, then the, the community fails. So, uh, the argument here is that uh, that the potential total information of the system is directly proportional to species, and that's the number of species each uh, the number of species per unit area multiplied times the information content of each species, which on average would be about the same. Uh, so no no uh, redundancy in the system. Every species does its own job and nobody else's and that's going to give you the maximum possible rate of information increase, uh, the analog of marginal metabolic scope. But in real systems, uh, there, there gets to be redundancy. You know, some individuals overlap with other individuals. So uh, what, I, what I claim is that the analog of carrying capacity for populations is uh, a carrying capacity for diversity of the habitat or ecosystem. And what I mean by that is, uh, per unit area, you know, there's more complexity. A more complex system is going to provide more opportunities for different kinds of animals or different different species, more more niches. So, uh, you know, a, a rich system is one that provides a lot of complexity uh, for lots of different kinds of things to happen, which is kind of a problem in culture of fish or cotton or anything else, you know, monoculture. You know, you want to, you optimize for production of one, for, of one, for one niche and you lose everything else or lose a lot of the others. So the argument is that as the species richness goes up, uh, the scope for the development of the community increases. Um, and that's analogous to metabolic scope of the individual. Um, I'm not saying this maybe as well as I did in a previous occasion, but okay, so the pattern that you're starting to see here is, or maybe you're not, that the scope from one level of organization gets translated together with directives from the next level into the resource that is processed at that level. So you got the scope here, and that becomes the scope at that level plus the directive factors at that level is what is on the x-axis and then the rate of performance is on the y-axis that generates a scope at the i-th level and the i-th scope plus the directives at the i plus one level give you the scope at the i plus one so that's um, maybe a little too uh, a little too what a little too uh, a little too symbolic, maybe. Here's my final uh, slide. 
in biology of fishes. My final uh, diagram, and this is an attempt to bring the pattern I just showed you to a conclusion here. I call it a unified field theory for ecology. That's a little bit presumptuous, perhaps. Uh, but I think it's toward one. I don't say it is one. And so the argument here is, and you're just back in time for the denouement here. Allison had to take a break. I don't blame her. I need to take one, too. I'm going to take a long one. So, so I'm going to start over here in the lower right. We're talking about the pattern of organization and its, uh, its propagation upwards. Over at the lower right, we've got the abiotic system, you know, a bunch of substrates and a bunch of enzymes, or maybe just one, sub, you know, sub, one enzyme, one substrate. And as the concentration of the substrate increases, the velocity of the reaction can increase. Um, you know, it looks like that, maybe. And uh, notice that I don't show any, uh, any uh, minimum, any, any, any analog of standard metabolism. I'm not sure there is a standard, a minimum level of velocity here. Maybe there's activation energies or something that come into that, but I haven't bothered to show one. And then I would argue that you take this abiotic system of enzymes and substrates and you add that magical ingredient called life, the ultimate directive response, at this level, so you got now the resources and life, which are moving along the x-axis, and the metabolic rate of that biotic system is going on the y-axis, and you get metabolic scope. And metabolic scope of the individual gets translated, or metabolic scope of, and I got a little bit of a, I think I've, what I've done is broke my individual into two stages here. Maybe this is an organ or a tissue. And then up here is the individual. Metabolic scope plus directives, which get translated into the weight of the individual. Basically, the biomass of the individual is the metabolic scope and directive factors that operate at the level of the individual to give a growth rate. Scope for growth. Scope for growth plus directives at the cohort level give biomass. And what's processed is what, what, what is on Y here is production rate. Production of the cohort of new biomass. And then the scope for production gets translated with the directives at the stock or population level to give spawner density. That's the integral of, of all of that scope for growth down below plus the directive factors that operate at the level of the population. And so then we got recruitment rate. Now that's the graph that we saw at the, for population. We got, uh, I showed spawner density on X I didn't talk about population scope plus directives. I just showed the, the the sum and recruitment rate. So we got scope for recruitment. Uh, scope for recruitment plus directives at the level of the community becomes spawner density. That's the one that you saw for the community. And you got the information uh, processing rate at the community level. And then you could argue an ecosystem up here at the top. I, I sort of, you know, I'm not going to worry about that one. I'm not going to worry about any of these. It's up to you to worry about these if you want to. You don't have to, Chris, because this probably isn't going to be on the exam at all, you know. <laughs> um, maybe this will be on some future exam for some of you somewhere down, your, down the road, you know, in your lives professionally. So i got a little final advice to offer you. And the first up of these pieces of advice is that you need to uh, always work on ideas in your mind and try to make sure that you complement those data with some good ideas about the data, not just the data, you know. Uh, if, if it's just data, it's just, it's just uh, sand buckets full of sand at the beach, you know, grains of sand, but you've got to organize that stuff to make sand castles. So think about how things work, how fish work, how aquatic systems work. If you're going to be an aquatic systems person, most of you, I guess, are, either will be or are already, and how nature works. And everybody, I think, here in this room is certainly interested in natural systems. And everybody that's paying any attention to this presentation, wherever you are, is interested in a natural system. Uh, to, to do that effectively, to engage ideas you don't have to be a mathematician. Uh, 
you don't even have to be a professional scientist, I think, but you, you need some training and you need some tools and you need to care. Um, you know, care about uh, building something, something bigger than you maybe, some ideas, a new body of knowledge. And I hope it gets you everywhere that you ever need to go. But uh, some might recognize that as a quotation from Jim Croce, who said, even if it gets you nowhere, you can go there proud. So that's it. I'm in all in, all done. I'm going to punch the pause button and then cry. Yeah.